Hello and welcome back to Arches. We will be continuing where we left off, which, if you recall, is um, after Cameron, the little coyote here, disappeared into the motel room while Devin and Artie were being attacked by Duke, who was messing with Artie's car. Uh, also, if you if you're new to the series, because I know that I gained a whole bunch of followers ever since, you know, I mean, uh, after the previous episode. And since I started this, um, you know, take the time right now and go watch the previous episodes and, you know, catch up before you can, you know, you start this video. So yeah, I would appreciate it because admittedly out of all the series I do, this is one of my favorites because I get to do it with uh, my friend Beowulf. So yeah, <laughs> it's a very silly thing to to be really into, but I, I like doing it with him, even if we record separately because we're like not anywhere near each other right now so and trying to record it through discord would be a little difficult but um anyways um yeah so please you know go back and watch all the previous ones and then you know jump onto this one if you're new or if you're not then you know if you want a refresher you know go watch the other ones again <laughs> and just so you guys know this is the sequel to echo so if you like Echo, this is, you know, what happens afterwards, and this is the story of closure and, you know, ending the cycle uh, of, you know, violence and despair in Echo. So yeah, this is why it's a bit more upbeat, and this is why the relationship between uh, Cameron and Devin is so much more different than the relationship between um, Leo and Chase, Yeah, uh, you know, in, in case you guys haven't noticed that yet. But anyways, uh, let's begin. Despite having seen this monster in some form or another over 15 years now, Cameron realizes that he never really tried to move towards it. In the beginning, he tried to run away, of course, but it ended up following him. It never moved when he was looking at it, but the second he looked away and back again, it would reappear closer, usually at that 20 or 30 foot distance. When he learned to ignore it, it just sort of blended into the background, and he almost stopped noticing it. As Cameron squeezes through the boards covering the window, he's only a few feet away from the thing. He realizes that if he makes contact with it, that if it's solid, then he won't know what to think. He never even considered that it might be real. But now, as those unnaturally long claws dangle from the sleeves of the raincoat, Cameron starts to wonder. As he moves those last few feet, though, Raincoat Monster starts to dissolve into the dim lighting of the room, and the coyote is inside. It happens in a way that makes Cameron think of a mirage. But that creature is still here, now across the room, against the wall, its ever-present, deranged grin plastered to its dark furred face. Cameron moves towards it again, slowly this time, the creature still seemingly frozen but in a way a real person would try to appear frozen. This creature is almost like an imitation of the one he's gotten to know so well, the one that almost became a companion of sorts in his childhood. About halfway across the dark, clustered motel room, Raincoat Monster bends sideways, almost like it's going to do a cartwheel, towards the bathroom door. Its heavily clawed hands don't move though, and instead it just keeps bending like a bridge, like an arch and then it slips into the darkness of the bathroom. Cameron stares, the feeling of unease growing. Of course, shit like this always makes him feel uneasy, and makes him feel fucking crazy. But what just happened now, it felt deliberate, like he's being toyed with somehow. Raincoat Monster had toyed with him plenty of times before, especially the first time he saw it. It was his own mind doing it, after all. But what makes him feel nervous now is that it seems like there's something else behind it. Almost like whatever was behind his first vision in that other motel room is behind this one as well. So, he should leave, right? Whatever that is doesn't seem to have a very good intentions. All it seems to want to do is fuck with him. If it's the same thing that hijacked his first vision, then it could look like anything. It disguised itself as Dev and said awful things to him. Disguised itself. 
Was that even a disguise? Is it possible Devin somehow made that call? That would be the most plausible explanation, aside from malicious ghosts being real, something he never believed until now. He trusts Dev, though. Cameron looks at the boarded window. Why did Artie and Devin abandon him like this? Is this part of Devin's investigation still? Is this a setup of some kind? Like a test? Cameron continues to just stand in the middle of the motel room, staring around himself. This isn't right. He's not making sense. These thoughts don't make sense. But there are some connections, and he can't deny that something is off. The voices, the whispers, it continues to ebb and flow, and there's a slight electronic quality to them. It's not impossible that someone could have planted a speaker in this room to make him think that he's hearing the voices of ghosts. After all, Devin had been so adamant that he not come back to the motel with him to gather his equipment. That would have been the perfect opportunity. He tries to listen to them, but they blend together and mumble quietly, and he can't make anything out. If this is a setup, then Raincoat Monster could be a real person, someone, someone in a costume, or... Something is wrong. Suddenly, thinking itself becomes difficult. He's still high after all. But at the same time, things are suddenly making at least some sort of sense. If this is some kind of sick joke, that could explain a lot. A distant chuckle breaks through the hushed whispers. It sounds kind of like Devin. Devin? Cameron points his ears towards the bathroom. Artie? Guys? You can't really be doing this to me, right? His voice is weak, unsure, and afraid. Something creaks to his left and the coyote jumps, staring wide-eyed. Guys? In the back of his mind, Cameron knows that whatever this is, whatever is going on inside or outside his mind, is not good. He needs to get out. Suddenly, something starts pulling at the boards of the window. Cameron gasps, stumbling back, an explosion of fear taking over in a way that he's never experienced before. Cameron! You in there, right? Are you okay? It looks like Devin, but the coyote is moving for the bathroom because he's not completely sure, and even if that really is Dev... Cameron pulls the door to the bathroom closed and fumbles with the knob until he finds and presses a push lock somehow still in working order. Cameron! Honey! Are you in here? Cameron keeps quiet, pressing his paw to his muzzle, suppressing his instinctual urge to respond. Cameron! Cameron listens to the bear's heavy footsteps on the ruined floor. Then, the doorknob to the bathroom vibrates violently. Cameron yelps. Stop! I I'm sorry! I just... I need to figure things out right now. There's a pause, one that seems to go on for a very, very long time. What? Devin's voice is equal parts confused and concerned. Baby, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What happened? I, I don't know. Why did you guys leave me? Leave you? I'm right here. I looked up the road, and you were just gone. Oh, Cameron, something happened. It's a little complicated, but I can tell you about it on the way out. I'm sorry I left when I said I will watch you, but we need to go right now. Something happened. It's a little complicated. Cameron, please open the door. Devin lets out a nervous laugh. You are freaking me the fuck out right now, Connie. That only puts Cameron more on edge that Devin thinks he's the one that's acting strange. You're freaking me the fuck out. Why did you even bring me here? Is Artie there too? Another long, horrible pause. When Dev talks again, his tone has changed completely, like he's being very careful with his words. Like Cameron is crazy. Honey, can you tell me what's wrong? Did something happen? You tell me, Devin. You... 
are really starting to worry me, baby. Devin's voice cracks. Cameron doesn't know what to say. He doesn't have to think of what to say because at that point, something rakes painfully down his back. It's like a giant set of claws, and Cameron gasps, then screams as another set of claws grips over the top of his head. He completely forgotten about Raincoat Monster, but even if he remembered, he never thought that it could have touched him. Cameron! Open the door! Open! God damn it! Stand back, Cam! The air seems to explode as it flies open, the flimsy motel bathroom door splintering with ease as Dev kicks it in. With some light filling the bathroom now, Cameron sees that he's fighting with nothing. He thought it had to be Artie. Suddenly, the bear is grabbing him, trying to hold him, or pin him, and Cameron just struggles, trying to pull away. Cameron, what happened? Please, calm down. Just let me go. Cameron is crying now, and it's making him gasp for air. Let's breathe, Cam. No, stop doing this to me. Just let me go. Doing what to you? What happened? I don't know. I don't fucking know. Cameron's struggling becomes more wild, kicking out and fighting with Dev's much stronger grip. What the fuck? Dev seems to say it to himself, almost in a whisper, as if unable to believe what's happening. None of this... None of this is real, is it? Uh, wh what? Did you set this up? To make me believe or something? Wh what? Who will I do that? Speakers or costumes? I don't know. <laughs> You're hurting me. Devin lets Cameron go finally, though he tries to hold on to him to make him look at the bear. But Cameron takes the opportunity to escape, running right for the window, much easier to get through after Dev's entry. <laughs> Cameron. I'm sorry, I just need to think. Cameron can hear Devin crying right now, but he can't stop. He needs to get out. He needs to get away. He falls clumsily through the window, and as he stands up, he gasps as he comes face to face with Artie. Suddenly, he notices how similar the color of his fur is to the raincoat monster. Whoa, dude. You okay? Oh, what's going on? I can hear you guys yelling all the way. Artie trails off as Cameron backs away from the cat, keeping him in view until he runs away, up the road, to somewhere that's not here. Dev sobs as he fumbles to get out the window, wondering if he's dreaming. This can't be happening. He looks around the parking lot, but all he sees is Artie. Where did he go? Artie points wordlessly, and Devin jogs up the length of the parking lot to look around the motel. Cameron is nowhere in sight. Devin stares for a while, hoping to see Cameron pop up from behind one of the dilapidated structures, but he doesn't. Uh, Devin? What happened? Something's wrong with Cameron. I know, he looked totally freaked out. Did that meth head get to him too, or something? No, he's... I don't know. He's not making sense. He's not thinking right. Uh, what do you mean? Devin takes a deep, shuddery breath, still staring, realizing Cam might have made it to the dirt road off Main Street already. Devin rubs his face vigorously with both paws. He said something about us setting him up. Uh, setting him up? For what? I don't know. It's like he's completely... He's not in his right state of mind or something. Devin stops himself from saying completely lost it, because that just sounds wrong. Seeing no sign of Cameron, Devin suddenly feels panic boom in his chest. What if Cameron is so far gone that he's gone off into the desert? He would die. Shit! Are you sure he ran this way? Devin starts walking quickly up the road, looking at each abandoned structure, scanning the desert landscape all the while. 
His panic has settled into a dull, persistent feeling of dread, and his crying is mostly under control, just sniffling every now and then. Artie follows behind him. Yeah, positive man. He was running though. Ah, oh, shit. Hey, you know, he just looked really emotional. Doesn't he have panic attacks? Y yeah, but that wasn't just a panic attack. Something else is going on. Has he done this before? No. Isn't he on medication? No, man, he's not on medication. But, uh, wasn't he? Dude, this isn't helping anything right now. Sorry, it's just that I remember him telling me that he was on an antipsychotic back in college. Devin's blood runs cold. I think it was just like antidepressants or something. Why will he even tell you? Cameron! Devin's voice echoes hollowly up the street, unanswered. He was on both, I'm pretty sure. He was talking to Maria about it since she's been on a bunch of them for her bipolar disorder. I think he was just looking for advice on how to deal with the side effects. And I'm a psych major, so there's that. Are you? Cameron! Uh, duh. I'm a failed STEM major. Behavioral sciences are the next step. Despite that being something Artie might normally say, it sounds forced, like he's trying to keep the mood light. All Dev can think about right now is how he couldn't have even bothered to know what medications his boyfriend was taking and why. He just knew they made him feel like shit. So Devin encouraged him to stop taking whatever it was he was taking, and Cameron seemed happier after that. Anyway, I'm not saying he's like, schizophrenic. Antipsychotics can be combined with antidepressants for just plain old depression sometimes. I think he's just panicking a little. I probably would if I went into that motel alone. No. Cameron was panicking, sure, but he was accusing Devin of setting him up, of tricking him. Cameron didn't trust him, and that's something Devin has never seen before. And remember, with his tolerance, he's probably still pretty high. Could have just been paranoid. Devin gasps, and Arturo stares at him, frozen. Then rage and horror explodes in Devin's chest. <gasps> the fucking weed! Whoa, uh, uh, what happened? You fucking knew he has problems! Was on medication in college, and you just let him get stoned? Artie stares. Well, I didn't remember until now, and besides, if that's what's making him freak out, it's gonna wear off. No! He said I was tricking him. He didn't trust me, Artie. He said I was planting fucking speakers so he would hear voices. Artie continues to stare, but doesn't say anything this time. Devin does his best to avoid saying what he thinks is happening. That's not just panic, that's... more than just that. Fuck, man. His mom died because of this shit. What if he's running into the middle of the desert right now and... When he had researched psychosis, he came across plenty of stories just like this. The way so many of them ended. Devin feels like he's about to throw up. After a few seconds of silence, Artie clears his throat. Um, listen, we don't know anything yet, but if I cause this to happen, I'm sorry. Either way, I'm gonna help you find your man, okay? It's only been five minutes. Devin starts to calm down a bit breathing more evenly. And I know it's not exactly the same, but like I said, my girlfriend is bipolar and she's had moments like this too, and we always come out alright. So how about we look for 20, maybe 30 minutes, I'm sure we'll find him. If we don't though, I'm gonna run my ass back up the road until I get cell phone service and call 911, alright? Dev takes a shuddering breath. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's go. There's no way. There's no way. Cameron shakes his head back and forth, unwilling to believe that Dev, his boyfriend, the person he loves the most, would do this to him. But why? Devin is the one that wants to leave, 
that wants to protect him from this nightmarish town. How would this help at all, making all the ghosts up? Devin truly wants to understand what's happened to Lupita, where she is. Nowhere. So, he'd want Cameron's vision to be true. Unless it's both. He couldn't have been involved in the vision he had by the lake. Right? Or what he heard in the forest. Those were real. Cameron feels it deep down that they had to have been real. He couldn't have made up that recounting of the forest creature, or of the girl being murdered. Maybe Devin was worried Cameron would give up if he didn't see anything and wanted to make sure by... by hanging himself in the closet, by creating one of the worst moments in Cameron's life. Devin would never do that, would never think to do that. As he's thinking this, something flickers in Cameron's vision. It's hard to describe. There's a vividness to what he's seeing. And then the light begins to change, just like it did next to the lake. The coyote stops, rigored and apprehensive, not really interested in having visions at that moment. He doesn't have a say in the matter, though. This time, the lightning takes on such a surreal, ominous, blood-red glow that even though Cameron thought he was prepared, he definitely isn't. He stands in the unnatural light, feeling a bit sick, but then realizes he's actually someone else, just like when he saw the girl's life ended. But... He seems to snap into his host, and looks down at the body of a creature he can't quite make out. This person he's become is breathing heavily, doubled over, his giant paws on his knees, feeling sick. He'd never killed someone before. This little fag deserved it, at least. He spits on the body, then suddenly realizes that he needs to get rid of it. As far as he knows, no one knows that he's here, all the way from Peyton, and if he can get rid of the body, no one will ever know he did it. He prepares himself, finding it easier and easier to come to terms with the murder. The thrill he got from it, the swooping feeling in his chest that immediately made his dick get hard. It's a bit worrying, even to him. With a deep breath, he leans down, but then suddenly feels like he's being watched. Slowly, he looks up. It hovers over the road, watching him. He'd seen a handful of UFOs, all of them while he was in Echo. He'd come to realize that it wasn't aliens or whatever the fuck people believed in. It was supernatural or whatever. He suddenly thinks back to last week when the space shuttle blew up while his class watched it on TV. He'd been the only one to laugh when it happened. Not really because it was funny but because it was so unexpected and so boring up until that point. To him, that's the only way space could be haunted with ghosts. But for some reason, he doesn't think anything living is involved with this. What he realized is that those crafts made of metal, glass, and covered in lights are empty. As far as he's concerned, they are no different from the ghosts. Ghosts that weren't people at all. They're hollow shells only there to feed on the sick feeling he got when seeing them, only there to watch him so that the small amount of guilt he had might grow just a little bit bigger. And tonight, aliens would visit him to torture him, to violate him. Not really aliens, but the same thing as the ghosts that people see in this town. It's all the same. So he ignores it as he gets to work and it hovers over his head, even as he feels its red eyes on the back of his neck. Cameron isn't sure what to think right now. A UFO? What? While that shadow creature in the forest had been strange, he hadn't seen it, he only heard someone recounting it. Cameron assumed that the man in his vision wasn't in his right mind, maybe misinterpreted what he was experiencing. But this, and a full-blown craft in the sky above a dead body. Now Cameron is almost positive he'd been toyed with, like the raincoat monster in the motel room. 
It just makes him feel like he's going crazy, and it reminds him that, for some inexplicable reason, he thought Dev might be in on it. How did he even consider that Dev could be involved in this? Besides, even now, despite it being almost completely silent aside from the crunch of his footsteps on the gravel road, the voices are insistent, even louder, and how would he hide speakers out here in the middle of nowhere? Now that he's focusing on the voices, he can actually start making out some words, sentence fragments. Singing, they sang. Sins of cities are always. You piece of shit, stop doing. Every time he catches a new voice, it fades away before it finishes what it's saying. Cameron stops so that he can hear better, ears up. But the voices fade back to barely noticeable whispers on the wind. Cameron remembers those ghost hunting shows that he watched a few times, the way they're always trying to communicate. So he clears his throat awkwardly. Uh, hello? Are you trying to talk to me? Do you have something you'd like to say? Cameron isn't even sure he should be saying you, because the voices are such a mixture of many. But why would they all congregate on this dirt road? Either way, they seem to have moved on. So Cameron starts walking again. It's something we should see. You think you're special. Stupid shit. Again, Cameron stops, and so do the voices. Uh, hello? Silence. The words don't even really make sense. If the ghosts are trying to talk to him, wouldn't they say something useful? Maybe they just dislike him. Or if it's a replaying of something in the past... Why are they just babbling nonsense? Cameron sighs and takes a step. You stupid. The coyote freezes, suddenly making a connection. He looks down at his foot, then brushes it back and forth over the gravel. Stupid sack of shit. Cameron stares. It's coming from the gravel. From the sound of it, anyway. A gentle wind tickles over the fur in his ears, and the whispers continue. Suddenly, he's back in his trailer with his mother. He's laying back on the couch, nodding out after snorting his pills. His mother on the other side of the trailer is kneeling amongst the trash. She'd always been meticulously clean, emphasizing that while they might live in a trailer, they can still make it look nice. But over the past year, she'd seemed to care less and less now. Dishes were used and never cleaned, boxes of takeout opened and left where they were eaten. Cameron himself couldn't be bothered to tidy up. It's easier now that his mom doesn't give a fuck. He can do his drugs right in front of her now. The post-it notes and strips of fabric tie to every arch his mother spotted, even to things Cameron is pretty sure aren't arches, made the place look like a disaster anyway. What, what does bother him, though, as he watches her through half-lilled eyes, is the way she looks. Her fur is disheveled, and sticking up in different places, and she's in the same clothes she's been in for a week. She started to have a strange odor about her, but Cameron felt too weird telling his own mom she smelled bad. It's sad. He almost wishes she'd scream at him and slap him like she did whenever she found his drugs. Almost. Because right now he feels so good, and she's happy enough to listen to that fan. Cameron covers his muzzle, heart pounding, listening to the whispering wind. No. No. His eyes blur with tears. He turns around because he's worried someone might be watching him, and his feet scrape the gravel. Sadness seems to always. Cameron covers his ears, feeling the now familiar rising tide of panic in his chest. He's going crazy. Just like his mother, he's losing his mind. But his mother changed over the course of months. This is so sudden. He's never heard voices before. Or has he? That hallucination he had of Devin hanging, that was a voice. But that could have been a dream too. Now Cameron's breathing is really starting to get out of control. And he wants to run back to Devin and apologize just so that they can hold each other again. Of course, Devin wouldn't fuck with him over this, and Cameron can't understand why he thought that. It seemed like a possibility just five minutes ago. 
but something holds him from running back right now. And that's because if he's crazy, if he's crazy, he doesn't want Dev to see it. Sure, he had a few nervous breakdowns and panic attacks in the first few years of their relationship, but that's normal crazy. This, this is actually crazy. It's psychotic. And while Dev would hold him, comfort him, take him away from this place, who's to say what would happen after that? Behind his outgoing nature and warm smile, Dev would be doubting their relationship. He already is. He'd be worn down by Cameron's deteriorating mental state, his deteriorating hygiene, the deterioration of the man he once knew as Cameron spirals further into delusions. Stop it. Stop. Stop it. I'm not mom. No, but you're her son. That voice, the one that comes from inside his head. That one doesn't feel like his inner voice. That one won't shut the fuck up. Cameron is walking back the way he came, back towards Devitt, towards what he knows is real and safe. But is he? Yes. Even though he's scared, he says it confidently, and strangely enough, he feels what seems like a pause on the voice's end. Like it's not quite sure how to respond. Good. Cameron thinks with his own thoughts this time. He makes sure to walk to the side of the road, the dusty, somewhat rocky surface preferable to the whispering gravel. Devin keeps trying to figure out how things could have gone so wrong. His feelings earlier about an impending catastrophic failure now feel fully validated. It's happened. He took those courses emphasizing engineering ethics. He studied cases in which every step of a disaster was detailed and exactly how each step was preventable. He took great care in his career to make sure that he would never become one of those case studies, that the machines he helped design were as safe as possible. And while he already thought of this, it's the fact that he didn't even know Cameron was on an antipsychotic at some point, just that he was on meds. He knew Cameron's problems were concerning, and he reassured himself with a crash course in abnormal psychology. Psychology. While he was never as openly disdainful of his peers, the idea of trying to explain complex behavior through endless theories was frustrating to say the least. He chalked it up to him being one of those people who simply needed a solid answer, a number. But he also remembers those months when Cameron was on his medication, how one night he had Dev sit with him in the arts building on campus. It was late and no one was around as Cameron almost angrily bashed at the keys of the grand piano, asking him if any of it sounded good. Dev said it sounded fine. Then the coyote finally broke down, saying he couldn't write music anymore. That emotionally things had become black and white, that there was a wall between him and who he was. And as Cameron sobbed over the piano, Devin had decided that psychology doesn't know a thing about how people work. That psychiatrists might as well be drug dealers with an office. It had been the same for his mother after what happened with Lupita. Even now, she struggles with her addiction to benzodiazepine, something carelessly prescribed to her so that she would stop wailing all the time. To Devon, it seemed like psychology never moved past lobotomies. Instead, they just converted it to pills. And he never really changed that mindset, and it's why he never encouraged Cameron to seek some sort of help, especially if he didn't want it. What he took away from his research is that hallucinations of any kind are a serious concern and should never be brushed off. But he had done just that with the idea that maybe there's more to hallucinations for some people than psychology will ever understand. Maybe it's ghosts. Devin wants to hit himself. In fact, he wishes the weasel man had added a kick into the nuts to go with a gut punch, something else to help remind him of how utterly stupid he is. The concept of the paranormal is so far from his mind at this point that he doubts he'll ever dabble in it again. See? There he is, dude! Devin looks up and sure enough, he sees Cameron running towards them. The smile of a relief on the coyote's face seems to break the dam of emotion in Devin's chest. That wild look he had earlier, the one that had looked at him 
as if he were a stranger, is gone. The next thing he knows, he's running too. He wonders why Cam is running on the rough rocks and thorny vegetation, but Devin joins him and Cameron runs into his chest with a thump. I'm sorry, I don't know what the hell I was- <laughs> Stop, you're fine. That's all I care about. You're fine. But I don't know if I am. You are. You are here and you're fine. And we are gonna go home, okay? Yeah. Careful! Devin, rocking them back and forth on the uneven, rocky ground, sends them to the dirt. But Devin just pulls Cameron into his lap, still hugging him tightly. Meanwhile, Artie is looking away, seeming to have spotted something very interesting in the miniature forest just off the road, though he's smiling. I, I, I'm so sorry for bringing you here. I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm just sorry. No, it's my fault for thinking I was special, that I had superpowers or something. I don't know if this is your fault, okay? Cameron stays quiet and Devin is content to just hold the coyote, both of them sniffling. Meanwhile, the coyote plucks at the sagebrush that's rubbing up against them, which he holds to his nose. You know how I hate the desert? <laughs> I'm starting to hate it too, actually. Cameron inhales a sprig of sagebrush in his paw again. Well, I love the smell of sagebrush, the way the whole desert smells like this. Mm, I suppose it's alright. There's something about it that reminds me of Christmas. That's weird coming from someone who grew up surrounded by pine forest. Like when we went up to my dad's cabin. No, that's a smell I can get behind. I guess I got used to it. And sagebrush is just different. The desert version of pine forests. Pines can grow in the desert. Then I mean the ones in the northwest. We should go to your dad's cabin again. That was fun. Oh, really? I told you didn't like it. In all honesty, Dev hadn't either. He had meant to take Cameron ice fishing, like his father had taken him so many times. The second they got there, though, he realized how woefully unprepared he was. I complain too much, but we should go in the summer so we don't have to dig through four feet of snow just to open the cabin. Dev almost laughs at the memory of being so exhausted by the time he opened the cabin that his plans to romantically make love to Cameron went out the window the second they got in bed. <laughs> yeah, I will ask my dad when we get back. I just want to be somewhere with you. Away from this. Yeah, far away from this. Dev, I don't think I'm actually psychic. I hallucinated a UFO a little bit ago. That was not real. Oh, you just said one? Well, in my mind, I was someone else. I saw a dead body and I saw a spacecraft in the sky. It didn't make sense. Uh, I see. Well, you won't have to worry about that anymore once we are out of here. I really, really hope we won't. Dev isn't going to ask him to elaborate, or tell him that the UFOs are commonly reported in Echo, especially in times when supernatural activity is at its peak. While he wants to convince Cameron he isn't mentally ill, he knows that that's not what he should be doing right now. Even though he wants to deny it, he doesn't know if it's true or not. He believes Cameron is psychic, but that has taken a backseat to the possibility that something else is happening to, and Dev can't be the one to figure that out for Cameron. He can only be there to support him. Oh shit, I think Artie's in the forest! Huh? Sure enough, Artie's disappeared. Oh, yeah, well, he will be alright. We will just scout for him, not really a big forest any- Dev, that's what the shotgun guy is! Oh fuck! I forgot. Dev stares at the tree line, hopefully. Dev, we have to get him. Well, he shouldn't be fun at all. Anyway, let's keep our voices down. They get up and move towards the forest. Dev wants to tell Cameron to wait on the road, but at the same time, he's worried about losing him again right after finding him. 
Somehow, the seemingly innocuous patch of trees is even more ominous during the day. RD! Dev whispers loudly into the trees, holding Cameron's paw as they descend into the ditch and over onto the forest side. They only take a few steps into the trees before Artie calls back. Yo, just taking a whiz. Figured you guys wouldn't want me staring. Dude, shut up! Dev continues to shout whisper. Uh, what's up? Dev can see movement from Artie now, some of the bushes about ten feet ahead of them, shifting. This is where that shotgun cake get yelled at us. Oh, well, I'm almost done anyway. Dev sighs, then notices Cameron with his ears low, looking anxious. You are right, babe. Do you hear, like, radio static? It's really loud. Dev listens, but only hears some wind through the trees. I think it's just the leaves, honey. But then, there is something. Maybe what could be described as static. Actually... Jesus! He jumps as his phone's notifications goes off. Well, I definitely hear that. I don't think it's just a whine, but I'm hearing it too. He takes his phone out, seeing that an email managed to get through. Important booking information. Due to the ongoing public health emergency, all reservations have been cancelled. We sincerely apologize. The notification banner cuts off there, and the surreal message makes Devin feel like they're isolated from the world now more than ever. He wonders if he should try to call the police, even though he still only has one bar. At this point, he'd be willing to just let the authorities know that they're stranded before anything else can happen. Then something out of the corner of his eye catches his attention. It looks like the wall of a structure of some kind, beige and peeling, hard to see through all the leaves and branches. Devin holds up his paw in front of Cameron, signaling for him to stay put before taking a few cautious steps further into the forest. He thinks it's a trailer, one that looks so run down that he wouldn't be surprised if it's abandoned. What unsettles him is that it's buried so deep behind the trees, it's like it's meant to be hidden. He can try to make a call further down the road, away from whatever that is. I'm here, I'm here. No need to check on me. Okay, let's go. I'm gonna try to make a call on the road, but we are going straight. The look on Artie's face makes the bear pause. What? What the fuck? His voice is quiet, but the tone is in complete disbelief, staring over Dev's shoulder. Devin feels dread creep over him, not sure how something else could be happening right now. Something so terrible that Artie has that look. Cameron stands where he left him. Oddly enough, he doesn't even seem to be paying attention to them. He's staring up towards the trees, and Devin can see his eyes darting from left to right. His ears are laying back and twitching, like he's hearing something that's too loud. His breathing is heavy, and Devin can see his chest heaving. He's panicking again but the reason for it is clear. About a single second is all Dev has to see it. And to hear it. And then it drops onto Cameron. Cameron is suffocating. Just moments ago, he'd been gasping breath, feeling the invisible dread creep up on his back, the deafening static growing in his ears. But now, it's completely black, and something has its limbs around him, fingers over his mouth and nostrils. He's thrashing about, or at least he tries to. He goes through the motions, but there's no sensation of movement. A straining inhale of air drones right next to his ear, the thing pressing its head to the side of his face. Cameron begs it to let go, tries to call for help. Devin was in front of him only seconds ago. Or minutes. The voice in his head returns. Or hours. Or has it been years? It doesn't matter when you're dead. Cameron does think that he's died, and that he's in hell, because of course he'd end up there. There's no hell. There is no death. This is what happens to everyone, Cameron. Cameron realizes then, that it's not the thing holding on to him that's speaking to him. Because now is when it starts to speak but it's not a voice he expects. No! Get away! A woman's voice. Stupid fucking brat! Cheating whore! 
a man's voice, a sickening thud. The tone of static changes, and Cameron knows he's listening to something different, a different moment. He's dead. You can stop now. Nah, he's still twitching. And it continues. It sounds like someone screaming through a gag. A woman sobbing. A man begging. But then there's a shift. And though most of the voices were women, they become almost exclusively young men. If you let me go, I won't tell anyone, I swear to God. No me mates. Por favor. Stop, stop, just stop. And then the voices blend together and go on and on and on. Meanwhile, Cameron goes limp, giving up, feeling as one with the voices that come next. Why don't you just kill me? Devin watches as Cameron's body goes limp, and though he tries to leap forward and catch him, the coyote slips to the ground at his feet. The bear instinctively picks him up, or tries to. Though it's something he'd done many times before, he'd never done it while Cameron was so completely lifeless. Cameron! Cameron! He's laying the coyote out on his back, hoping he just wakes up. What the fuck was that? Dude, what the hell was that thing? Whatever it is, was just seen to absorb into Cameron, disappearing in an instant. Devin doesn't care. Two days ago, he would have thought he'd give almost anything to see something like that. Now, it doesn't seem to matter at all. Cameron's chest that had been heaving seconds ago isn't moving at all now. Fuck, fuck, fuck! Artie, he's not breathing, man! What do we do? Holy shit, um, maybe chest compressions, right? Right? The panic is threatening to overwhelm the bear, his peripheral vision dimming, going dark, and he has to rest a paw next to Cameron's head to steady himself. He can't pass out now, otherwise Cameron would only have already to help him, and the cat is seemingly frozen, his fingers twisting into his head fur. Why is this even happening? Why would he just stop breathing? Devin tries to tilt Cameron's head back, straightening his torso so that he can breathe. Come on, come on, come on! Breathe! Come, just breathe, please! Devin rubs at Cameron's chest. It's such a desperate, useless gesture. Do you know how to CPR? No! Devin readies himself, wishing he could remember a single useful thing from the one day he learned about CPR in high school. All he remembers is tittering up with his classmates about the female mannequin's chest and how they had to touch it. His vision blurs as he uselessly places his paw one over the other on Cameron's chest. And then a droning, raged wheeze comes from the coyote's mouth. Oh my god, Cam! Another labored wheeze. He's breathing! He's breathing, right? That's right, Cam. Keep going, baby. He is, but it's still strained, like something heavy is on his chest. Not sure what else to do, Devin pulls Cameron into a sitting position, leaning the coyote against his body, and Cameron gasps. <laughs> oh, thank fucking god. Just keep breathing like that, honey. Yes! Even Artie is crying, wiping his eyes as he laughs. But what just attacked him? You saw that thing, right? Or am I crazy? Devin shakes his head. I, I don't know what it was. I don't know. Now Devin just needs Cameron to regain consciousness, so he knows he's okay for sure. He never had seen evidence of, or believed that the supernatural could physically harm, the living. Let's get out of the forest, dude, in case it comes back. Yeah, 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 right. He's very careful with how he moves Cameron, terrified that his breathing might stop again. But as he stands, cradling Cameron in his arms, he looks up. Standing 20 feet away, towards that trailer, is another bear. He's holding a shotgun. To be continued. Oh, it's gonna get good next episode. Because we, well, if you have played Echo or saw my playthrough of Echo, you know who that bear is. It, it should be obvious if you also, you know, uh, watched my first episode of uh, Arches or any of the other episodes where I kept mentioning a name 
Brian, Brian the bear, the psychotic meth head bear that almost killed Chase twice. <laughs> or actually, no, almost killed Chase like three times or four. I forget. He's bad. Bad news bear. But anyways, um, what did you guys think of this episode? Um, I think the the action is going to, you know, start, you know, revving up more now. And I like this episode because it really outlines the difference, again, between Leo and Chase or between Chase and like anybody else. Um, well, actually, yeah, between the, the whole group as a whole, because um, if you played Echo or if you saw my playthrough or saw anybody else's playthrough of Echo, you'd notice that the group is not very good, like friend wise, like they're quote unquote friends. But they're terrible to each other. They are, it's like high school drama with them. They're just really, really bad. Like, and I, I say Chase is the, the worst one, but he's not technically the worst one, but he is like right up there as being the worst one, especially since he killed Sydney. I prefer Sydney over Chase, even though he, he's dead. Um, but yeah, um, like the whole friend group, it was more like, you know, we're 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 friends, but we kind of, you know, hate each other, are a little jealous of each other, are a little, you know, petty with each other and stuff like that. And like, um, like for example, uh, I don't want to bring this up because it's always a topic of contention with people that like Echo. But for example, Jenna with Carl. Uh, I don't have any issues with Jenna. I don't dislike her. But I do dislike the fact that people sort of overlook her also bad qualities because they're all terrible people, including her. But the reason she is like that is because when she was growing up, she was, you know, pretty much abused. Maybe not physically, but I'm pretty sure it was physical. Um, but um, mostly mental. And a lot of the time it was like, well, my friends have everything, you know, handed to them on a silver platter. And here I am, you know, struggling with a family that, you know, will probably kill me um, or, you know, have me end up like Janice, you know, the waitress that, you know, dies and pees on the side of the road. And um, but for all of her sort of um, holier than thou, I'm like, you know, I'm I'm more adult than you are. She she admits in in her good route. That she was always jealous of what everyone else had. And she was especially jealous of you know, the relationship that Leo and Chase had. Even though it was a terrible relationship. Um, and she pretty much kind of wanted to steal Chase away from Leo. But um, you could do better, girl. You know, Chase is not worth it. Um, and she was also jealous of all the wealth and opportunities that Carl had. That he just sort of squandered. But rather than, and, and she also, you know, she went off to college to be like, oh, I'm going to be better than what my family wanted me to be or than what my family was. And I'm going to go into psychology so that I can, you know, like th the way I see it, she went in there to sort of understand why all of these things happened, you know, like with her family, with Chase and Leo, with, with like Carl's like um, social, social anxieties. But she decided to go into the sort of, um, the the biochemical one the one that's sort of like the pills and i don't have anything against using pills in order to you know medicate for issues because i i i, I took stuff for my horrible anxiety and i should probably be back on it again after all of the covid thing and everything um but um she kind of instead of doing the the, the therapy part which i think would to me is kind of better well not not better but the one that you know would tell you more like this is why this is happening to them not the here's the pill to make it stop happening after you figure out why it's happening to them um or the 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 the, the therapy part instead of going to that she went into the part that sort of sidesteps that instead of trying to figure out why it happened to why it was why their family was like that but anyways um uh, I do have a lot of issues with all the other characters. Like Leo's just batshit crazy. And Chase is also crazy. He basically abused the relationship with Leo. 
and you know left him hanging for three years without actually telling him yeah we're broken up or anything but leo should have gotten the hint i, I mean come on but anyways back to my original point the the point i was going to try to make is that the relationship between Devin and cameron is way different because even like right now um Devin and cameron are having their issues now especially being in this town because the town sort of brings it out it, it, it uses it in order to get to you but even even though it's using it it can't really seem to break them apart it's trying its hardest to manipulate uh cameron who you know can see the supernatural but like once the high or whatever it was that was influencing cameron is over it's suddenly like wait a minute all of this is in my head or why was i thinking this in the first place like this isn't this isn't real and even when um when the voice that was in that was getting into cameron's head was like trying to tell him like oh well you know you're crazy or devin is not gonna think the same of you anymore or whatever cameron was like no he is like you know i'm i'm not my mom or uh devin isn't going to just abandon me and then the voice was like um it's getting a little harder or this is a big, this is a little bit more difficult than I was initially expecting it to be, and obviously Devin isn't running away from Cameron. He's trying to help him, even if he might be a tad bit psychotic or something. It seems like Devin is still gonna be there for him, you know, still gonna help him. And obviously he cares enough that he started crying when Cameron stopped stopped breathing. So. The relationship dynamic between Leo and Chase is not the same as it is between Cameron and Devin because in Cameron and Devin's is more real and um, they're more comfortable with telling each other what's going on. Whereas with the group as a whole, they always kept it all bottled up and it always, you know, exploded in, into something else. And even towards the end of each of the routes, stuff wasn't always completely said. You know, some stuff was left unresolved, too. But, yeah. That's why I prefer uh, Cameron uh, Devin. I mean, yeah, Cameron and Devin. Uh-huh. Because they're, they're just the better couple. The better Echo couple. Um, What else? And I, I like Artie, and I really hope he doesn't die, but I have a feeling that if anybody dies in this story, that it's going to be Artie, or he's going to get seriously hurt. I know... That this is supposed to be a, a less severe story than uh, Echo, but you know, come on, he, something has to happen to him because he's sort of like the devil may care one, the, the one that says like, "Well, if it's my time, it's my time." Come on, Artie, don't don't die in Echo at least. This is the worst place to die. If anybody dies, it better be the the um, Brian, the bear. Finally, get put to rest. Mm. I was, I had a thought that perhaps the town was using, um, socket face monster, but I doubt that he's gonna show up in here, unless he he's like that do sex machina and he saves them all. <laughs> he finally gets his revenge or something. What in the world did I click? Whoops, I clicked. Uh, yeah menu um but yeah anyways um i really like the story of arches and um and i hope you guys like it too because aside from being able to do with with bear it, it's just a better story to me because it's the the closing story to the the trilogy of um echo the town of echo and yeah oh I, one thing that i kept forgetting to mention um you know how they keep mentioning a space shuttle blowing up that space shuttle is actually the well in my mind depending on like the uh the timeline and stuff like that the space shuttle that blows up is actually the challenger explosion the it, it was very famous because it was going to be like a i think an all-female um crew and everybody was watching it because it was like oh yes like we're finally sending women to space and it's going to be like just just women in space and then it blew up on national television and it was just super devastating and or cameron's mom who's you know this little girl who's like looking up at, you know seeing like like this is what i want to do in you know in my future she sees it blow up that's like the major turning point for her and now it's also connected to brian 
who I, well, I'm assuming who's Brian, because, you know, large paws, you know, it's a bear. Um, uh, so I wonder if it's, you know, there's, there's all these little connections within the story that sort of intertwine between all of the, the people involved now, between Cameron, between Devin, I guess, already in some way, and now Brian, and, you know, uh, Cameron's mom. I have to wonder if perhaps something happened to Cameron's mom after she died where she became the the raincoat monster because it's been following Cameron and it doesn't attack him, it just sort of messes with him. But it could be sort of like with um, Socket Face and Jenna where the monster was always there. It didn't, you know, hurt her, but it, you know, it was like a concerning thing to have, you know, hanging around you. And the one that... The version of the monster that he saw in the motel room wasn't real, wasn't the actual one. It was the, the town messing with him and using that uh, against him. So I, this is just one of my theories, and yeah. I, I keep pressing the button. Go back. Uh, but anyways, um, what do you guys think? Uh, what do you expect to find at the end of the story? I know that, technically speaking, these two will not die. The it's not going to be as severe a story as Echo. I know that much because that's what they told us when they first initially, you know, released it. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping for a happy ending for these two, like that they stay together and they go on to live full, fulfilling lives together. I like I, I really like Cameron. I really uh, I'm not going to say completely connect with him, but I, I feel for him and I know what he's going on, you know, what's going on with him. I, I I recognize it or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I also really like Devin, and the whole reason why Beowulf, my friend, is voicing him is because when I first read it, uh, to my the the story to myself when it first got released, like immediately my voice, or I mean his voice, was playing in my head uh, with his lines. So you know that's why I had to ask him to do it. And oh, also, uh, you guys heard another voice, and that's um. Uh, my friend uh, Omar Alvarado, he's an artist too, and um, so yeah, I, I I just decided to ask him to do it, and you know he obliged, so you know credit as murder victim number four goes to Omar, <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying uh, Arches as much as I do, and again, if you are new and you just watched this episode and now you're intrigued as to you know what happened before, then you know. I have to play this with the first three episodes. I think it's three. Um, so yeah, um, go watch those. Or uh, hopefully you watch those first before this one. Trust me, it, it, it's good. Especially the first episode. And yeah. Mm, well, I guess that's it for now. And um, thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play Arches yourself, you can find it over on Itch. Or you can find a link to it over on um, the Echo Project uh, Twitter page, which I will link down in the description. And if you would like to support the Echo Project, so you can get early access to Arches at Astra Interia when it releases uh, this month, which I will also do, obviously. And also, I have a playlist for that here, you know, so you can go watch those episodes first. And if you would like to get early access to Glory Hounds, which will release uh, next uh, year, and also Know Your Role, which I think next year too. I, I don't know. Um, you know, subscribe to them. It's it's pretty cheap. It's, you, for I think it's for like three dollars. You'll you'll get access. Um, and I guess that's it. And I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye bye.